You are listening to One Dime Radio. Become a patron at patreon.com slash one dime to support the show and get access to extra content. We think that ideology is something blurring, confusing our straight view. Ideology should be glasses which distort our view. And the critique of ideology should be the opposite, like you take off the glasses so that you can finally see the way things really are. When you talk about a revolution, most people think violence without realizing that the real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the, in, in the principles and the goals that you're striving for, not in the way you reach them. Philosophers call someone a relative, by which they mean it's a person that holds that any view is as good as any other view. My simple response to that is this. No one holds that view. No one believes that every view is as good as every other view. Welcome to One Dime Radio. Today I am here with Ted Reese to discuss his book titled Socialism or Extinction. A really, really interesting book. One of my friends who commented on my video, Planet of the Robots, for those who have remembered. In that video, I said, Rosa Luxemburg said, it's socialism or barbarism. I said, it should be socialism or extinction. And one of my friends commented saying, oh, someone already wrote a book on that. You should check him out. He's a, he's a Marxist scholar. He has this great book. Check it out. And uh, yeah, so I have the most updated edition. He also has another book coming out, which I'll give you the chance to plug, um, coming out soon. And today we're going to talk about why capitalism is collapsing, how exactly, because a lot of people, every, a lot of people who listen to the show probably are, are critical of capitalism, but why is it bad and why is it actually, or is it at all collapsing? And um, what, is, what are the implications for climate change and automation? And so that's what we're going to discuss in the first half. And then the second half, we're going to discuss the solutions, which, to be honest, was probably the favorite, my favorite part of this book. I really liked how ambitious it was. A lot of critiques of capitalism just end off in something very vague. This one went into not just solutions involving changing capitalism into socialism, to communism, how that could take place but also about specific solutions for climate change, as well as strategy for how we get there. So I thought this was uh, very interesting. I do have some disagreements, which we might get into in the back room episode, but uh, without further ado, Ted, would you like to introduce yourself and also what the main arguments you are making with this book, and then we'll go into them. Yeah, so firstly, thanks very much for having me on. I'm a Marxist theoretician, I suppose, in, based in London, England, and I uh, have a background in, in journalism. I joined a Marxist group about, I don't know, maybe a decade ago, got involved with housing activism in London, and then I worked on the newspaper uh, it was a newspaper called Fight Racism, Fight Imperialism. And so, so I developed my Marxist politics uh, working in that context and, yeah, ended up sort of getting very interested in the theory side of things. Read Capital and read Henrik Grossman's, which called The Law of Accumulation and the Breakdown of Capitalism, which I think is the best defense of Marxist capital. That was written in 1929. And so I draw heavily on that to describe, you know, contem the contemporary situation, which I describe as capitalism entering its deepest ever economic crisis. And then I try to apply that, all of that theory to the climate crisis as well. And mm, I'd sort of, so I, I do think we're, so I kind of basically argue that we're entering the end stages of capitalism and that capitalism is the root cause of the climate crisis um, because of the nature of production under capitalism. So one thing I argue that isn't really, argue, isn't really talked about that much in, in sort of eco-socialist or environmental activist groups 
or critiques or whatever, is that it's the labor intensity that capital production relies on that makes it so dependent on extractive production, as in, you know, metal mining and mining for fossil fuels. Whereas other types of production would be possible if that weren't the case. So I end up arguing that socialism is necessary to mitigate and ultimately save the planet because then we can trans transcend away from this labor intensive extractive dependency and move towards something that is, isn't so dependent on extractive production. And there are a lot of technologies emerging now, which I sort of refer to as pre-socialist trends, which are, which aren't extractive or subtractive, but rather additive. So in summary, that would refer to things that are, are grown or replicated in a lab, for example. 3D printing is an example of additive production because instead of cutting things out, like with a metal mill, for example, you're, you're layering the shapes with the 3D printer. So that's just one example, but there's plenty more sort of emerging. And I try to relate this directly to the way capitalism develops because it does need to devalue production over time to sort of overcome each crisis that it has. And so there is a sort of brewing, emerging incentive to invest more in these additive um, technologies along with automation. But then I argue that is undermining the, the foundation of capitalist relations of production. And so it's going to necessitate a a uh, revolutionary rupture and break with capitalism and necessitate socialist relations of production. In your book, you claim that we're about to face and are, or are facing the greatest ever accumulation of capital and the greatest ever capitalist crisis. And to prove this, you use uh, Marxist theories, particularly that of uh, Grossman, Henrik Grossman, um, who elaborates and clarifies uh, Marxist theory of breakdown and the tendency of the uh, rate of profit to fall. People in the past have famously predicted the end of capitalism. Marxists have, of course, after 1929, the Great Depression, people predicted that capitalism would collapse and that there would be socialism. And of course, they were mostly wrong. What makes this time different? And second, what exactly is the theory of, what exactly is breakdown theory and the tendency of the rate of profit to fall? Because most people don't actually know, including people who might claim to be Marxists. Okay, I'll just I'll, I'll answer the second point first. So the breakdown tendency arises out of what Marx calls the rising organic composition of capital. So the, the composition of capital, it's, it's composed of labor and human labor and technology. So as our productive capacities rise through innovation and productive expansion, what we find is that the amount of technology in terms of mechanized machinery, most of capitalism's existence, but increasingly now automated production tends to rise relative to the amount of human labor that is part of that process. So we call that the, the ratio of machinery is, or of capital is rising relative to the amount of labor in the production process. So as that rises, the amount of labor available to exploit in times of the appropriation of labor time that instead of going to labor goes to the capitalist class um, through the mechanisms of production. So, so workers go to work, they work using machinery, their time is being absorbed by the machinery and then into the commodities that these machines produce. So that's the process. 
that value is contained at the end of the process in the commodity. The capitalist sells the commodity. He keeps most of that value for himself and then uses some of the, that value to pay the worker for their labor time. The value is realized as profit, but it's also surplus value. It's value that the, that isn't going towards the necessary value that laborers need to reproduce themselves with food and clothing and shelter and all the rest of it. So you get a point of devaluation that naturally occurs in production. This is a basic economic point that no one disagrees on. The more we produce of a commodity, the more each commodity devalues. So there's less value per commodity because we've increased our productivity of it. We're, in, we're producing more in less time. So it's devalued. So that's a natural tendency that no economist disputes. When you get into Marxist theory of it, so Marx and Grossman, you know, they point out that this value needs to go towards capital to reproduce the value of capital and more of that value needs to go to capital as time goes on to offset this devaluation. Then part of the value has to go towards labor because the capitalists need the works to do the work. And then part of the value also needs to go towards the consumption of capitalists because otherwise there's no incentive for being a capitalist. So this whole process breaks down with this devaluation process as commodity production increases. And you get, on average, you get a, a breakdown every 10 years. So basically negative growth or recession or whatever you want to call it. And as time goes on, this inspires the capitalists to to innovate again so at the end so there's probably a, a natural human tendency to innovate anyway because that's what we've always done we've always you know to to develop labor site sorry labor saving technology and life enhancing technology and that sort of thing so i think that is a natural thing anyway but under capitalism the pace of that is regulated by what we're refer basically referring to as the law of value. So the law of value is that value comes from um, the exploitation of labor, the theft of its labor time, which increases over time in order to try and offset this breakdown tendency where there's not enough surplus value being created to reproduce and expand the amount of capital value that's contained in capital, as in the machineries that produce commodities and within the commodities themselves. So you get an over accumulation of capital, which is a manifestation of this rising organic composition of capital. And another manifestation of that is the overproduction of commodities, which a lot of communists refer to as the source of crisis, but that's just a manifestation. It's a, it's sort of like a byproduct. It's, it's essentially the same thing, but it's, it's important to point out that it's this overaccumulation of capital, um, whereby you get a surplus of capital that can't be reinvested profitably. So that's when you say capital, point. I think a good point to clarify is like for the non-Marxists yeah. is investment. And yeah. when you say cap, like in surplus of capital, you mean surplus of investment. When you say surplus of value, you also mean commodity production. Yeah. Yeah. And when you say profit, you also mean, uh, sorry, sur when you say surplus value, you mean profit as well. Yeah. So, like on the surface level, sort of thing, a profit is just getting back more than you invested in terms of your money. But what it essentially represents is getting back more value than. You, then you have invested and, and that value is a, a representation of labor time, essentially. Right. And a good example, because sometimes I find economic concepts can be very difficult for people who are visual yeah. type of learners. <laughs> and 
I tend to be pretty decent with economic concepts, but I notice it's where a lot of like I lose people the most. That yeah, yeah. almost as much as with philosophy. But I think a could a good example be like when we see the stock market, and when we see people investors who you know invest in a company on the stock market, they buy shares, they expect a profit to be higher than the next round, and they as a result expect they anticipate like a higher level of demand and a higher level of profit. And as that, while the company might continue getting more profit, it, the rate of profit going down will lead to people selling the stock because they see, oh, it's not going to yield me more investment in the future. Because how do we explain like Tesla stock going up and them firing workers? A lot of people who don't understand that, but I think it makes sense from a uh, Marxist standpoint. Yes. So the bit I missed out there was that this overaccumulation of capital is also like expressed in the rate of profit fall, tending to fall. So you see over time, the more capital accumulates overall, the more the the general rate of profit tends to fall. It's an inverse relationship. But yeah, with that, a way of offsetting it is centralizing capital into fewer hands, by which I mean you get a tendency towards the monopoly ownership of production. So fewer capitalists owning the means of production in relative terms. And so you see more people investing in, in, in a Tesla um, because of that, it's part of the centralizing tendency of capitalist production to offset the breakdown tendency. So in your book, you go over various different crisis theories, because of course, that's the field in which this is in. People try to theorize the crisis of capitalism, or if they're uh, more euphemistic about it, they just say business cycle, as the more mainstream economists do. And you uh, talk about why... Uh, Henrik Grossman is important, uh, saying that he's essentially clarifying what Marx was actually saying about crisis, whereas there's all these other people who came in between who tried to say, well, actually, it doesn't really work such and such way. One thing that you attack pretty hard in your book is the harmonious theory, which is subscribed to by social democrats who believe that you can offset capitalist crisis. This was quite, of course, popular when social democracy was big. Uh, when it, at, in its heyday, you have thinkers like Herbert Marcuse, who pretty much thought that capitalism was impossible to uh, collapse. He, he thought that it was just going to um, stabilize. And of course, there's other people like Paul Matic, who kind of made similar points to Grossman, it seems. But it, what exactly, so why exactly are social democrats, reformists, people who think that you can fix this business cycle? by, I don't know, full employment programs, like a lot of Keynesians believe in fixing. Why are they wrong? So they're arguing that if you implement the correct reforms and policies at the state level, that you can get a harmonious, ongoing, indefinite accumulation of capital without crisis. And so crisis is only caused by mismanagement and greed, so is basically the argument. So there's the underconsumption theory of crisis, whereby capitalists are either too greedy to uh, to pay their workers sufficiently, um, meaning they can't buy commodities in sufficient quantities for a sufficient amount of profit to be realised. Or there's the other, there's the Rosa Luxemburg theory of underconsumption, which is that capitalist countries run out of um, non-capitalist countries to export commodities to, but that's wrong because that's implying that there's an overproduction of surplus value rather than an underproduction of surplus value. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm not saying consumption has absolutely nothing to do with crisis, but it's mainly a manifestation when when you get an underconsumption of com commodities, it's basically related to the overproduction of commodities, which is, a as I say, a manifestation of 
the overaccumulation of capital. It, it's this surplus capital that can't be reinvested profitably. The incentive for pro capitalist production is to make a return on your investment, a profit. So you have to look at that. That is the key thing. No, no amount of reformism within capitalist relations of production can change that essential basis. So let's say that a social democrat comes to power, raises, implements a policy that forces capitalist enterprises to pay their workers, let's say 10, 15% more. What does that do? That eats into profit margins. So the rate of profit falls. So the incentive for investing in capital expansion um, diminishes. So you're then actually accelerating the tendency towards having, an, having another recession in terms of negative growth. And so what's the outcome of that? The capitalists lay off the workers. Um, what happens if the social democratic state legislates against that? Well, the capitalists will go on an investment strike. And so it intensifies the, the essential class contradiction in, in a capitalist society and intensifies a class struggle to the point where you either need to progress to socialism, whereby the public and, and the working class owns the means of production. Um, and if you don't go all the way in, in, in those terms, then it ends up falling back the other way where the capitalists inevitably take back control, full control, and implement the policy that they need to raise the rate of profit and, and their profit margins, which is lowering wages and cutting costs on public spending and working conditions and all the rest of it. Just to go back to the first part I didn't answer from your previous question, which was what, why am I right? What, make, what makes this say, time different? Yeah, what makes this time different? So, Because the criticism is that Marxists have uh, predicted the the last the last um hundred of the three yeah. prices or whatever and that um it, it becomes a bit like a boy who cried a wolf type situation where yeah. because of all the predictions some people don't really take it seriously why should they take it seriously yeah and that's a perfectly valid critique or question to have the reason is we're further down the line so if you look empirically the rate of profit the general rate of profit is a lot lower than it was, say, 100 years ago, around the time of the Great Depression. The, the average interest rates are, are similar. They're much closer to zero than they were 100 years ago. And they've been falling, you know, generally over the last 700 years. Prices of technological commodities and other commodities like food have tended to, not all foods, but most foods, have tended to fall towards zero again because we're because our productive capacity is is that much higher the valuation of, of each commodity has been devalued that much more the uh what else is there there's i've got i've all of this is in in the data i've you know i've listed it all empirically but the gist of it is that there's a lot well, there's an awful lot of graph. automation is i think yeah so i was biggest, gonna you call, say that you talk about the final contradiction yeah, so I was going to come on to that. So we're, like I say, capitalists have to innovate to devalue capital because solving each crisis, the crisis solves the crisis, the thing. So you, so, so you get to the point where you get surplus capital, which essentially means that the money capital that you have um, isn't enough. It's too expensive to invest in, in expanding the capital that you already have. But the crisis reduces demand for capital, which causes panic selling, which means you get cut rate prices. And that devaluation of capital enables a new round of investment because what was too expensive before has become cheaper and is now profitable to invest in again. So this dynamic system, this inherently dynamic system drives this whole process historically. So every round of um, negative growth sort of intensifies the tendency towards innovation. And actually that tendency strengthens over time um, or tend to strengthen over time. And so 
we're now approaching, you know, there's a lot of talk about a future society of fully automated production. And we're certainly approaching the sort of innovation that whereby we can start to think about that seriously. Whereas I don't think that was the case in a hundred years ago. Obviously it wasn't the case a hundred years ago. And the thing about automation is not only does it replace labor much more quickly than, than mechanized machines did, the, it has a qualitative difference, which is something that I've highlighted that I haven't really seen highlighted elsewhere. And that is that mechanical mechanisms are binary, uh, technically binary operations, whereas automated operations are non-binary. So with binary operations, you have an on-off on operational relationship. Over time, I've sort of said it's become less binary because those operations have become quicker. So like with semiconductor transistors, we can, we can go from on, off, on, off increasingly quickly with every new generation of transistor, for example. So we're getting to the point where that's becoming so quick that we have to take a qualitative leap for the next innovation to become, to be, to be usable. And that, so with like, for example, with quantum computing, the com computational operation would no longer be a binary operation. It would be a non-binary operation, what they call a, a superpositional operation, where instead of one or zero, it's anything between one or zero. So that's something that I think is highly significant in terms of not only being able to point to the empirical data, which shows that we're getting very close to a zero uh, rate of profit and a zero percent like historically consistent um, interest rate that is is getting closer and closer to zero every time to the point where we've even had negative interest rates in the last decade for the first time. This is an important thing to point out because it's not just, we can't, we're not just pointed to quantitative aspects we're, we're talking about really profound qualitative leaps as well and so it's quite obvious to sort of it's quite obvious to sort of think about a fully automated system of production couldn't be um couldn't be capitalist because there's no way there's no manufacturing workers to pay and so there's no one to buy anything obviously we might discuss People might think, oh, well, people will just work in services, but I, I would point out that people working in services aren't as exploitable right. and we can go into that if you want. So uh, I wanted to actually get into the contradictions with automation because there's a lot of that in your book, but I want to first talk about that a related point, which is another way that capital seems to be coping with declining profit is creating bullshit jobs through the government. I noticed this in my own country, in Canada, it's, it's actually quite incredible how much, like such a huge percentage of the city of Ottawa is just employed by the state in bureaucratic jobs that a lot of which are kind of, don't really contribute a lot of value in, in terms of profit wise or, you know, use case wise either. But there's that and increasingly a lot of economies, especially Canada, but you see this in, in many places, are increasingly becoming rent dependent. Uh, dependent on rents. And someone like uh, Yanis Varoufakis talks about this a lot. And so to what extent, how come capitalism can't just continue through rentism as opposed to productive capital? What's to not say that we're not just going to move to a system where capital will profit off of things of zero marginal cost, like intellectual property or other margins, like, or just homes and it'll offset this through basic income. Now, I know you, you do address all these points in your, in your book, but I think that would be pretty big questions for the listeners, which I'd love to hear your response to. Yeah. So that's not to say that we won't 
move into that sort of thing increasingly while capitalism is sort of pro progressing through its death throes, but it's essentially unsustainable. So it's a manifestation of the decaying nature of capitalism. So there's this underproduction of surplus value, which means it's becoming harder to reproduce the capital value that, that exists in capital in means of production. So the capitalists need to offset this by redistrib redistributing value from the classes below, whether that's from capitalist rivals, and that's where you get monopolization as well, or just from workers and consumers. So if my rate of profit is falling, I need to think of ways to offset that. So I'll introduce subscriptions or I'll raise taxes on people's income or I'll raise interest rates so that your mortgage goes up. But that's unsustainable. You can't keep doing that forever because you're going to impoverish your own source of income. So this is where the consumption side is important to, to analyze, but I'm just stressing that it's a manifestation of the production side, the sort of the decaying relations of production whereby you get this more and more, I mean, monopolies have always been rent seeking, but it's just an intensifying um, dynamic whereby they're becoming more reliant on it because of this underproduction of surplus value at the point of production. Mm -hmm. Now, back to the automation point, in your uh, book, you talk about the contradiction and, and uh, using real world examples, but also Marx's own theory and uh, the contentions and controversies surrounding his uh, alleged predictions of automation. And one thing is that you say, on the one hand, capitalism needs investment. It necessitates investment in order to uh, make the productive process more efficient so that they can yield more profits. However, on the other hand, you also say that capitalism in, in many ways is a stifles innovation and stifles automation and ca socialism is actually in, is fastens automation much more effectively and you give the soviet union as an example but also you talk about why the whole fantasy of automated capitalism promoted by the likes of elon musk or let's say andrew yang why that is impossible now that might seem like a paradoxical argument to some people because marx was of course enthusiastic about capitalism's ability to innovate but why, how on the one hand is capitalism also not innovative? Because you, on, you give this example actually about how automation was at its high point during, during the 50s and 60s. And in this period is when, of course, there's the welfare state and social democracy and like a more state Keynesian capitalism. And it's slumped significantly since the 90s and 2000s. Yeah, maybe get, get into that exactly. It's still like, why is capitalism actually not innovative? And what's to say by that exact example that social democracy can't just make it innovative as it did for a period? Yeah, so, so capital, capitalism is innovative, but the rate at which that innovation can take place and on in a quantitative sense as well is fettered is restrained by the inherent dynamics of the system. So like I say, you get an overaccumulation of capital, which is surplus capital that can't be reinvested profitably, at least for a time while the crisis is unfolding. And it's not until after the crisis has effectively been resolved. It's like a, it's like a self healing pro process. But during that time, capitalists pull out their investment or at least reduce partially their investment in production. And so you get a, a slump in the amount of produ uh, production. And that means you get a slump in the amount of time and effort going into innovation. Once that crisis is over because of the devaluation process that unfolds, that can be ramped up again. And then that, and, and we see the most innovation when prices fall. The thing with social democracy 
was that it came on the back of the Second World War. So the Second World War played a massive role. It, it was the primary factor in, in, in ending the Depression because what happened was the war and the destruction destroyed that surplus value and it and uh, uh, sorry destroyed most of the surplus capital and the surplus capital that it didn't um destroy was devalued at an accelerated rate the other thing was that the state paid for all the innovation during the war which took the burden of the upfront costs off of capital and then after the war those innovations could be commercialized and diffused into the civilian economy, which then, so you basically get a situation where the public is paying for all of the innovation and capital reaps the rewards, reaps all the profits. So, so the innovate, the cost of innovation is socialized, but the rewards are privatized essentially, but this was unsustainable. It was only a temporary outcome you had the you had the destruction of the surplus capital which meant that you had new profitable opportunities arising out of that destruction because if i you know if i blow up a bunch of factories that creates profitable opportunities when new factories are needed to replace them with cheaper technology that's that's come about through that destruction so that helps to bring profitability back to a sufficient level that makes uh, investments plausible again, possible again. But after the 50s and the 60s, the same tendency, the same breakdown tendency eventually arises. The innovation reduces the amount of labor relative to the amount of capital that's employed in production. You get... So you get this ratio of more capital relative to the amount of labor, which inversely brings down the rate of profit eventually after, you know, the cycle unfolds and the system goes back into crisis. And then it becomes a question of the class struggle intensifying. And as I said before, what we needed was socialist revolutions whereby we resolve that crisis by taking the rest of production under public ownership, but it didn't pan out that way. Capital remained strong enough at that point in time to, to employ enough workers to be able to divide the working class essentially. And so capital won at that point in time and we reverted to the more sort of conventional form of capitalism, which was a liberal, um, liberal democracy and neoliberal economics. But this neoliberal phase is also unsustainable for exactly the same reason, because this tendency for labor to become a smaller portion of the productive process continues. I'm going to ask a question that's going to be sound a little controversial to some listeners. But uh, I couldn't help but think about it because it's been on my mind for a while. And I've heard certain people argue this, like Adolf Reed Jr. And that is what people are calling woke capitalism or like capitalism's tendency to adopt progressive, increasingly progressive rhetoric, not just literally politicians trying to pander to the masses, but literally companies uh, like they have their scores on how safe they deem companies. And there's this effort to integrate what were previously marginalized people and still marginalized parts of the population, minorities, transgender people, women, people of different sorts, the sort of identity politics. Is that a, a, a response to the falling rate of profit that could try prolonging it? Because I heard some Marxists like Chris Catrone went even as far to make the really radical claim, which I don't know if I agree with, that it's possible for capitalism to actually eradicate racism or superficially, uh, in order to prolong capitalism, because it needs to inter it needs more consumers and it needs more people buying things and making things. Well, uh, yeah, that last one is the essential point. It, capital, part of the way capital resolves the crisis, you've got an underproduction of surplus value, right? 
So what do you do? You, you expand the number of people that you're exploiting. So anyone that wasn't previously part of the labor base can be brought into it. So the most famous example of this is women entering the labor force during the world wars, um, especially World War II. But we've seen that continue. I think it's actually plateaued in the last couple of decades in terms of the proportion of women um, who've entered the workforce. But yeah, um, this has been a fact. This has been a factor in every sort of positive reform that we've seen within capitalism. Like even with like the end of apartheid in South Africa, apartheid in South Africa became a fetter on the expansion of capital production because the white supremacist state was preventing uh, the black population from entering the workforce to, to a large extent. So that actually played into what, not, it certainly wasn't the only factor. Like another factor was the sort of revolutionary potential that was building up within the, the black townships. So that was one incentive for ending apartheid. But the other incentive was that, that, you know, the white supremacist state was becoming a fetter on international exports. So yeah, the need to expand the labor base has kind of played a progressive role in that sense. And, you know, I do say, I have said that I think capitalism has a... Progress well, Marx said it was progressive. It ha- yeah, it has a progressive tendency sort of overall. It's just when it goes in, when it goes into crisis, it tends to go backwards, at least for a while. Yeah. And then exactly. when the, yeah. And then when the crisis is resolved, um, you start to see at least some, um, sort of social progress again. And this has totally played a massive role in sort of social liberalism, usurping social conservatism. Because the more different people from different backgrounds mixed in the workplace, the more familiar they came with each other and the more, you know, sort of differences, sort of more assimil- more social assimilation, basically. And, you know, you, you see more mixed marriages and, and that sort of thing. So that's totally, it's a natural part of the, it's the process of, cap- of capitalism. And history in general, Um, but but yeah, do corporations also sort of do it as a token gesture to an extent? Yes. You know, the way they do it is often amounts to a token gesture as well, because they can only do it on a fractional basis Mm -hmm. because they still need unemployment. They need to, they need to cut public spending. So like everything, it's dialectical, it's working in two directions. I bring that up because one for the right wingers who tend to overfocus on culture and not on economics, but also for people on the left who sometimes still use, I think, older terminology or rely on it too strongly when describing capitalism. Like, if, for example, people often say a uh, white supremacist settler colonial patriarchy, patriarchal capitalism. They use all those adjectives in unison when uh, it's not necessarily the case that capitalism must have those things because, and I say that not to say that all these things have overcome. I certainly don't make that claim, but the problem with saying stuff like white supremacist capitalism and uh, uh, assuming that capitalism is inherently white supremacist, how do you deal with the question when you have like increasingly CEOs who are of different races? The issue is that actually kind of makes it hard to oppose the system if you rely on that sort of terminology. You know. I say that only for the audience because I did, I've did. i noticed that a lot when I engage in a lot of um, academic literature. There's a tendency to kind of lump these terms together, and I feel like it doesn't it actually forgets that capitalism has a reason to superficially overcome these other things. I say superficially, intentionally. Um, but on to the next point is where we're getting, coming closer to talking about solutions, and I think this point will will bring us right there. And that is, of course, aside from automation, a big theme of this book is climate change, the climate crisis. I don't really think it's worth <laughs> proving as to why this is happening. Surprisingly, I do get some climate deniers every now and then who comment on some of my videos, surprisingly. But 
I think what's more important is why certain solutions that are often popular, why that's not enough and where we should go further. You, you talk about the inability for capitalism to deal with climate change, which is still actually quite a lot of people contest that. A lot of people think that you can just geoengineer the carbon away. You can, you can have a nuclear energy. You could also, there's all of these solutions, net zero. You also critique the Green New Deal. Of course, not imposing reforms entirely, but you critique there are all their limitations and problems. I love to see you go into that and then your solutions with climate change because that was, I found that very interesting. I'm still actually finishing up that part where you talk about uh, hemp and all these other sources of fuel and energy. and Yeah. 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 So just very briefly, like I say, because capital accumulation, which has to continue for the system to be viable depends on the exploitation of labor. So the more labor intensive production is, the more the capitalists can offset that tendency for the rate of profitability to fall. And what's more intense than mining metals and fossil fuel from the earth and fossil fuel gets burnt and that causes climate change. The intensity of ag of capitalist agriculture depletes the soil so we lose the carbon that's sequestered in the soil the intensity of deforestation means that all the carbon that's stored in the forests is also desequestered and and rises up into the atmosphere so that's why c climate change is happening so we need to reverse that process we need a mode of production that isn't dependent on the exploitation of labor and that labor intensity, because that would enable us to transition to a non-extractive mode of production. So like I've said at the outset, there's all these, there's all these technologies that instead of being subtractive or extractive are, are called additive, where you're growing your materials, you're replicating them in labs, and you're layering them instead of instead of cutting them out so it's far less it's the opposite of labor intensive and obviously this is highly related to automation additive additive production is automated production so you've got hemp which grows very quickly it's self seeding it doesn't take a lot of human labor to process it let alone grow it so it's the reason that that hemp was basically prohibited in the US and that prohibition, the US made sure that prohibition spread around the world uh, mostly, was because the cheapness of hemp and its versatility, you can make all sorts of things out of hemp. There's like 50,000 applications that can be made from hemp, including batteries that early studies have suggested are, are more efficient and powerful than, than lithium, for example. You can make carbon negative hempcrete out of hemp. The list goes on. It, it's, there's absolutely, there's obviously you can't do everything with hemp, but you can use it instead of toxic, what's the word, like paints and soaps and cleaning agents. Because all, a lot of these products that we use, you know, they're actually carcinogenic because there's the materials, some of the materials are, are, are sourced from metal mines and fossil fuel. This is, a, you know, capitalists, once they dig up the fossil fuel and maybe they don't, maybe they can't use all of it for energy they, because of the overproduction of commodities, they have to find new ways of commodifying it. So it gets, so the clean, some of the cleaner ways we used to produce things like fume free paint, we don't do that anymore because we needed to because we depend on this exploitation and the intensity of, of exploiting labor. But yeah, it's not profitable to, to use hemp on a large scale because like I say, there's not a lot of labor to be exploited doing that. The NASA is doing is that, research. The only, is that the only reason why it's not more widely adopted? And did the Soviet Union use hemp? Like, I'm curious. I can't remember. I don't think this, I don't think the Soviet Union used it extensively, which is, was possibly an oversight on their part. I don't know. 
how well the Soviet Union would have been able to grow hemp in, in its conditions, in its geographical conditions. So I can't really speak to that. I mean, this is partly why I argue for, you know, it, it is a global solution to the climate crisis. I mean, it's a global crisis, so it has to be a global solution. But there's a lot of talk about, about Africa becoming a, like a highly profitable region of hemp production. But of course it, it gets talked about, but it never actually happens because there's a lot of, there's a lot of expertise in growing hemp and cannabis in, in Africa, but it's not really utilized because of this sort of international prohibition that the, the U S imposed, but it does a lot of farmers sort of turn to it illegally in Africa because they, they have to, because of the lack of profit they're making. Nuclear is not sufficiently profitable either because we've reduced the amount of nuclear we're using. So nu nuclear is emissions free. So France built, France converted 72% of its energy production in the 70s or in the 60s and 70s to nuclear. So this was 72% of its energy production was emissions free. And the mm -hmm. Soviet Union invented the nuclear power plant as well. And obviously yes. that was public production. Oppenheimer just watched that. They Sorry? show that they show that in the Oppenheimer movie. They alluded oh, to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, when you know Thatcherism and and Reaganism wins out, we we see a stagnation in the proliferation of nuclear production because effectively you've you've got an an over over accumulation crisis in the nuclear industry as well as generally. And so they cut back on nuclear. So what's the problem with nuclear? Well, it's not labor intensive. You know, the amount of capital relative to the amount of labor being employed in nuclear production is, is obviously very high. So you get, and if you look into it, it was the fossil fuel industry that lobbied hard to stop the state putting subsidies towards um, nuclear and to redirect those subsidies into fossil fuel production. So, you know, a lot of the scaremongering about nuclear was, you know, a, you know, a fossil fuel led propaganda campaign. And where you do get some instances of nuclear sort of rebounding recently, it's on small scale, it's on a small scale or it's because China is investing in it so heavily. A part of that small scale stuff is like, because one of the tendencies of capital accumulation is for, for a portion of, because there's a dominant centralizing tendency, but there is a partial decentralizing tendency with every uh, crisis so where we've seen sort of the more modular nuclear solutions being touted recently. That's a manifestation of that. Um, but yeah, so we, like, if we decided that nuclear power was part of the solution for the climate crisis, because it's emissions free, obviously there are other things to take into account, um, in terms of mining for uranium, although, you know, thorium is supposedly a better option and, and a cheaper one as well. And it's much more abundant and easier to access, um, which means it's less labor intensive. Yeah. A publicly owned nuclear industry, especially within a publicly owned socialist ec economy overall, could absolutely move forward with that at a much quicker pace. But as things stand, you know, we've seen it in Germany most, most famously, they're cutting back on nuclear, which means when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, they default to fossil fuel production and increasingly the dirtiest type From of fossil Russia. fuel. Often from Russia, which kind of, they got all oh, now problematized by the Ukraine situation. Mm. Where can people learn more about hemp? Because that's something I think that will surprise a lot of people. I've heard, it's not the first time I've heard this. I've heard um, some people talk about this before and it's, I find it very interesting. Is where can people read about this, watch about it? I mean, I've referenced all of, all of the facts about hemp that I've put in my, in that chapter on hemp and and solutions to the climate crisis are referenced. Second Thought did a video on hemp. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Our Changing but, Climate, but, but, actually. That's another uh, yeah. channel who talks about that. 
Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Climate, changing climate. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, just Google it. <laughs> yeah. There's lots of sources. So we're getting close to the uh, one hour mark. So there's a lot I want to talk about in your book when it comes to solutions that we don't really have the time to get to here, but we'll discuss it in the back room podcast, which you can get access to on Patreon, because I really want to ask you about the proposals you outline in the chapter on how to save the earth and also the chapter regarding automation. You have very interesting, very specific proposals about land distribution, rent, and pro like compensation, how to prevent counter revolution. I thought that was a very important chapter because that's like a big question. And you deal with stuff like overpopulation. I would really want to ask you about degrowth. We'll talk about that. As well as some of my critiques or, or, or questions, concerns regarding uh, certain points, we'll uh, discuss that and uh, see all of you in the uh, back room. We're going to continue this conversation and uh, give it a five-star rating if you enjoyed, as usual, get value from this, and uh, be sure to pick up Ted's book. Anyways, take care. My only hope is that when enough people become pessimist, then out of despair, somebody maybe does something. But you know why I also like to be a pessimist? Because it's the only way to have a nice life. If you're an optimist, then always bad things happen and you are always uh, disappointed. When you are a pessimist, then you look around, okay, there are bad, but from time to time something nice happens and you are, as a pessimist, you are a little bit glad all the time, no? You are listening to One Dime Radio. Become a patron at patreon.com slash one dime to support the show and get